Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 485, with none other than Mr. Bruce Nesmith. Oh my god. Uh, first off, thanks to Shane for helping me connect with uh, Bruce, because he is a fantastic guest for Matt Chat. I mean, if you are interested in CRPG history or RPG history, this is a guy you're definitely going to want to sit uh, down and listen to. Uh, he's got roots going back to TSR, uh, but even before that, doing one of the first ever uh, CRPGs, one called Dragons, which we actually get to see on this program, uh, with Bruce playing it, no less. Uh, but he also worked at Bethesda, of course, working on, I think, a you know, creative lead even on Skyrim. He's worked on Oblivion, the Fallout series. He did a Ravenloft, Realm of Terror, uh, and he's writing a novel. <laughs> so... I mean, it just goes on and on. Incredible guest. But anyway, uh, Bruce has a lot of great stuff to share. So without further ado, here is Mr. Bruce Nesmith. All right, folks, look who I'm with. It's Bruce Nesmith. How are you, Bruce? My goodness. I'm doing great. Absolutely great. How are you doing, Matt? <sighs> I'm doing fantastic. I'm talking to Bruce Nesmith. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I, I say that because I, I think you're probably the perfect guest for this. Show. I can't imagine anybody that I've had on the show that's had had the sort of roots you have and pretty much all my my favorite things. <laughs> I mean, you've you've been there early days of computer history, you know, doing uh, programming back when there <laughs> were very few people doing it, <laughs> making making games. True. Uh, you've got the you were there at TSR, you know, during the heyday of all the all this great stuff we play, and then top of all that, you know, Skyrim. <laughs> I mean, Ravenloft. I mean, it just goes on and on. I mean, you know, the computers, you know, the tabletop, you know, board games. Uh, is there anything you you, you write novels? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes, I do? have. Do you play I have a, a novel out. Actually, Are there well, talents that you don't possess? Uh, yeah, I'm a. I am the world's worst artist. Stick figures. <laughs> Thank are, God for that. Something that I struggle with. So that's. Uh, <laughs> now this is my uh, my latest endeavor, the newest thing that I've been working on. So, the mischief maker. I've been reading this. You can get a. I don't know if it's just generally available, but on the Kindle, you can get a first three chapters as a sample. You can get it on uh, Amazon either in. Uh, uh, softback or uh, Kindle version. I just I challenge anybody to download that, read the sample, and not purchase the. You know, it kind of leaves you on this cliffhanger, right? You meet the the squirrel. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I want to know who could not, you know, spring for the book after reading the uh, the first bit of that. But you know, I oh, was thank thinking you. kind words. Yeah, I mean, you always. Uh, there's so many novels out there you know it's kind of i imagine it's kind of hard to even for for you to get a lot of attention on things but uh well, this that one, is the trick is letting people yeah. know it physically exists with the advent of on-demand publishing and uh small indie press explosion there are so many choices for readers out there there really are um you know, it's 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 a real boon to anybody who likes to read, and particularly fantasy and science fiction is just an explosion. But all the genres have seen an uptick. Unfortunately, when anyone can publish a novel, anyone can publish a novel. So that's, <laughs> that's the downside. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of the pluses and minuses of the Kindle. But you know, I watched a series recently on the. Uh, I don't know if you ever heard of Wondrium and the Great Courses. It used to be called the Great Courses. Now they're called Wondrium, but they put these get these university professors up there and they lecture about certain topics. But anyway, two, it just so happens uh, I just did two fairly recently. One was on Old Norse mythology. Oh wow! Okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just complete you can catch me out on all the things I did wrong. <laughs> no, no, we're the opposite. I was well, you know, there's there's stuff you're talking about in this book that I don't even think came up in those lectures. So I mean, you really uh, 
you know, did a deep dive for sure. And of course, yeah, you know, I was thinking too, like Tolkien, you know, he was immersed in the same, a lot of the same mythos and mythology. Yeah, maybe that's more the Germanic. Uh, yeah, what drew you to that? Uh, to that mythos? I did do a insane amount of research, probably way more than I should have. But you know, given my given my background, I'm uh, kind of a research nut on things. I like to really make sure I get it right and choose where I want to be different and uh, be wrong. Yeah, I don't think I'd heard of a Rat Rat Toasker. Not sure I'm saying that right, his name right. <laughs> I'm not sure I know the exact pronunciation either. Uh, that was fun. You know, I don't think you know. There's, there's so much wacky stuff in those those stories that go. You, know, you know, people probably know about it from Marvel movies and, and Thor, maybe. Yeah. But there's well, just my so book much more. A lot closer to the actual myths and legends. Uh, I find those to be far more interesting. Uh, I don't want to uh step anywhere near marvel's toes <laughs> yeah, i guess that's probably the, the what they call it the 600 pound gorilla <laughs> oh yeah oh yeah it's we'll call it the 800 pound t-rex how's 800 that 800 pound t-rex there we go uh but i'm not one of the other courses i watched those called how to write best-selling fiction oh. I, another great one uh, i mean you obviously i don't know if you've seen that but you're definitely applying a lot of those principles of like the, with the pacing and the, the way you handle exposition and there's so many like hooks for people to get in there you know like i say i was really impressed you read the first chapter and you're like i'm not stopping here <laughs> you've got to reveal this new thing you know now i've got to read the next chapter and it's like oh oh now this has happened you know it's like these all these uh sort of you know it's, it's very clever i guess the way you kind of structured all of this well, that's uh uh all my years working in uh, tabletop and video games probably uh, came into play with that. I've also been a voracious reader over the years, so I've read a, an awful lot of fantasy and science fiction. Uh, you know, you can't help but absorb some of that. So part of it's luck. I don't think I was actually concentrating on doing any of that, but uh, somewhere in the back of my head, I absorbed the uh, relevant lessons. Oh, I mean, you literally, literally start the book off with a bang. Oh yeah, I love I love my opening line. I do love my opening line. Yeah, I just think the whole setup. I mean, I don't know if you have thoughts about this becoming a TV show at some point. Or oh, Netflix. First, Apple it needs to become a successful novel. <laughs> <laughs> One step at a time. I know, but you know, I could just easily see this, you know, playing out. You know, frankly, it's it's a lot better than some of the stuff I see up there already. So oh, <laughs> I wouldn't rule it out. I'm. You have to see about getting a signed copy from me, maybe. Uh, I would be more than happy to sign anyone's copy. <laughs> yeah, but folks, I mean, I highly recommend this book, Mischief Maker. Uh, it's it's on Amazon. I mean, is there, I'm never quite clear. Is it better for people just to buy it on Amazon? Is there, you know, there it is on Amazon. Now, is this the best place to buy the book? It's the only place to buy the book. Uh, well there you go <laughs> should, it, should it become an enormous worldwide hit uh i'll get it actually uh, published to go into bookstores but uh it's uh it's a challenging world in publishing to uh go through traditional uh publishers these days so uh this turned out to be the better way for me to publish it mm -hmm. uh, using a small indie press publisher it's not self-published it actually did go through a uh a publisher and editors and all that so it's looking at that a craig craig martel, craig martel inc yep no nope. he's done a great job for me sound like a good company yeah he's published some 50 60 books something like that these are i'm really pleased i like to stay invested in the in the kindle because i do feel like it's making all sorts of books possible and accessible that otherwise you know if it was just up to the big publishers you know, they have such a limited selection. Well, the reviews are looking good. <laughs> I am extremely happy with the reviews. Wow. Yep. I, I could not ask for better, really. So I'm, I'm very, very happy with my fans. Well, let's dig a little bit into some of your, your history, Bruce. I know you, you've got some, like I say, you go pretty far back. <laughs> yeah, I do. Yeah, I do. <laughs> Uh, maybe even before we get into the 
uh, your computer game, uh, Dragons, if I recall correctly, was the uh, the name of that project. You, you were playing um, D and D before that, right, or some version of it that you sort of created on your own. <laughs> well, uh, the very first start was I had a friend uh, who was older than I am come back from college and start talking about this strange game called Dungeons and Dragons. Mm -hmm. And so he knew a guy who was even a little bit older than he was, who ran a session for us in his basement. And when I say basement, we were sitting on dilapidated couches with junk piled up all around us. And he was running out of the old white box uh, set with the little pamphlet books. Mm -hmm. And he had the, uh, the pink 20-sided dice that if you rolled them too many times turned into spheres because it would, <laughs> the plastic <laughs> was so cheap it knocked the uh, corners off. Oh, of really? Yeah. And then it's either really went, cheap plastic or real dedication. Oh, yeah. And then he went back to uh, school and he left us all hanging. Oh. So my friend Steve and I, I mean, we were hooked. So we sat around and tried to reinvent the wheel. And we came up with a completely different combat system using a, a double D20 and basically just invented the whole thing from the ground up based on a one four hour game yeah. session that we had <laughs> managed to be in where we didn't understand a thing about what was going on. Yeah, I recommend that. You can post a link for sure to Shane. I know you, Shane Stack's a good friend of mine. You had a chat with him recently and they talked about this. I'll refer people to, to that show for the full scoop on this. <laughs> but I was just, uh, I was so, uh, in, uh, I didn't know what to make. I guess uh, I was very curious about this. Your game had like the D6s, but you found a way to turn those into D20s. I'm still not quite sure I've understand exactly how <laughs> but you, you gotta you know talk about that a little bit that's just really a... well i of course didn't have any uh dice i didn't know where to buy dice i didn't know where you could buy this game uh and so we had you, regular in, you grew up in uh you were in wisconsin right uh at this point i was in uh, illinois i was in arlington heights illinois okay uh, i went to college in wisconsin went about to college an hour and a half up the road and so with only six-sided dice that we had, you know, stolen from various risk games and Monopoly and wherever else we could, you know, cobble them out of, uh, we figured out how to roll a 20-sided die with six-sided dice. And basically you roll the first die and you only pay attention to it for one through four. Otherwise you got to re-roll it. Okay. That's how that worked. Yep. And then that tells you which of the one through five, six to 10, 16 to 20, et cetera uh group it fell in and then you'd roll a second die only paying attention to the one to five range so there was a lot of re-rolling there was a lot of oh wait what did i do oh yeah that's this number and keep in mind it was two 20-sided dice so you had to do that twice <laughs> you must have been were you the dm i assume right uh yeah steve and i were the were the uh dungeon masters for the game sessions well, so he must have cooked up quite a quite a campaign well it was in the days still going when, uh, i think you said in that video right there's <laughs> friends still... it was in the days when you start in front of the dungeon door the campaign was you're standing in front of the door of the dungeon it didn't even have a name it was just the dungeon you know the and, dungeon right the dungeon and then yeah. there was a uh a graph paper that the dungeon master had with corridors and rooms. And then he had a random generation table, you know, he being me or he being Steve. And it just, it, you'd walk into a room, there'd be creatures there, you fight them, there'd be a chest, you get the loot, then you go to the next one. And then you leave the dungeon, you go to town <laughs> where you buy, sell and buy new equipment. You know, they, were, they didn't even have names for the vendors. The town had no name. It was just go to town. <laughs> well, so, that's all you needed, right? I mean, everybody was in, into it. Yeah, yeah. You know, only later did I actually understand that you could actually have a story involved in this, and not just <laughs> killing things and looting their dead corpses and 
So, you know, it was uh, definitely a raw, raw beginning, but, you know, it's a, it's a very addictive game when you have the total freedom of uh, action like that, even if you don't have the story going on, you know, it, it hooks you when all you've ever played is Parcheesi and Monopoly prior. And then I guess you were, went to college there in Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. Took up with this bad boy. Oh, yeah. Hewlett Packard 3000. This is Lee Courtney's video. I guess he's a big fan of this system. Is that what it looked like? I mean, there's a. Well, that's what the guts looked like. On the outside, it looked more like that. Uh, our unit was actually part of a desktop surface. So it had like this laminate surface. Yeah, that's what the screen looked like. And uh, it was hooked to uh, terminals all throughout the uh, college campus. And uh, I spent a summer uh, helping them uh, create a new accounting system for the college. And since that's boring as all get out, writing in COBOL, uh, I spent the remainder of my waking hours uh, making games. And I made about uh, five or six of them. And the, uh, the biggest one and the one that uh, grabbed the most attention was called Dragons. And just like my early experiences in high school, you started standing outside the door of the dungeon, unnamed box of square rooms. And you went through and fought creatures and yeah. <laughs> and the art was uh, all uh, ASCII art. So the walls were uh, hashtags and uh, the open spaces were periods and the monsters were numbers with uh, less than greater than on outside of them and mm -hmm. but it did have ray tracing two-dimensional ray tracing so you'd only see what you could actually see yeah that sounds pretty sophisticated yeah for for the time it probably was i mean i don't know if i could i could do something like that you must have had uh yeah how did you do that <laughs> <laughs> like you remember i'm sure it's in every line <laughs> well it's, it's not that uh it's not that difficult actually uh you for each square you figure out what the line is that uh runs along it and you look at each square along that line and if the square is filled you don't see that uh that resulting line and given that i'm only showing you like a Oh, what was the range of it? I'm not even sure. I think it was uh, something like six or eight squares out from where you are. It was a very limited uh, eyesight range, so you could uh, I could afford to process the entire map and uh, and display it. With that, you know, it sounds like it's not all that different from the games you designed with your friends and, and pen and paper. Just kind of this the concept applied to a computer. <laughs> yep. Yep. <laughs> and then yep. you know everybody was was loving it at the at the college right sounds like you had a well when the uh students came back in the fall mm -hmm. uh this is a brand new computer system and the only games on it were mine that was it if you wanted to play something you you could play my games or you could go do something different so uh they became popular by default, and then Dragons became popular also because people liked it. So this would have been, you know, what, what year would this have been? <clears throat> that would have been 1980. 1980. So they might, I was just trying to think if they would have been familiar with Dungeons and Dragons. Yes. Yes. So they would, not everybody. It was still still kind of in the shadows because the uh, the mid to late 70s is the era of the white box. And then uh, the bigger stuff came out. Uh, I wanna say the late 70s. I don't have a great chronology of my D&D books at my beck and call, but when I went to work for TSR in 81, the AD&D handbooks were uh, in the process of being created. Some were out and some were not out yet. Mm -hmm. You're uh... <clears throat> Uh, this game did not did it have the procedural generation type stuff oh yeah oh yeah wow so it would randomly determine the monster that you would uh, fight and you know i had a whole list of monsters that were not a whole lot different from one another it largely varied by their name but you know they had some different stats that's you know really so you hadn't played the like rogue or the <clears throat> telling no no you you were a hero 
any of those other uh was it the Plato system I think was popular oh yeah my friend Steve Steve Zetter who uh uh worked with me on the, the homegrown system he did a lot of the uh, a lot of the work on it actually the a lot of the math was his uh, he went to school at the University of Illinois, and he spent a lot of time on Plato. Mm -hmm. So that was one of his uh, uh, one of his home systems that he used a lot. I was getting asked, you know, what what is the first ever computer role playing game? <laughs> it's really tricky. <laughs> you know, there's some stuff that you hear about, but you know, it's, I think it's really serendipitous that you you're able to play your game. It is. And my hat's really off cool. to Gavin Scott and the Hewlett Packard users group for digging it out and to Tim Cahoon for uh, letting them know how to contact me to get me a copy of it. So I'll uh, be sending Matt a, a little video clip of me playing it so he can attach it to this later on. Yeah, we're really excited about that. Okay, so somehow you ended up at a TSR because they were wanting to do a, uh, I guess, a computer games division. I mean, who who can blame them? Want of money in that? <laughs> <laughs> well, my uh, my getting to TSR is is one of my favorite stories. I've told it before. I've told it on other podcasts. If you'd like to uh, uh, move ahead, we can definitely do that. But it's it's, it's oh, a I good want story. It. People here might not have heard it. No. <laughs> oh, that's true. That's true. So I made this game, which we already talked about, dragons. And I'm getting ready to graduate from college with a degree, a bachelor's degree in mathematics. And in 1981, there is not a lot you can do with a bachelor's degree in mathematics. You can either go to grad school, so you have something more than a master's degree, or you can try to find some other career. And it turns out that TSR is about 45 minutes down the road from Beloit College, which is where I went to school. And Boy College, great school, love it to pieces. And the salesperson that sold TSR, a Hewlett Packard 3000, was also the same salesperson that sold the college their machine. And she told the people at TSR, hey, this kid down the road at the college, he made something that looks kind of like your games. You know, you might want to talk to him. So I'm sitting here my senior year, twiddling my phones, trying to figure out what the rest of my life is going to look like when TSR calls me up and asks me to interview. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Um, my, uh, my line on that is, do not ever assume that your dream job will, out of the blue, call you, because it's only allowed to happen once in the universe, and it's happened to me. So <laughs> you guys are all out of luck. He's the um, but the counterpoint to that, and I've, I've done a lot of talks at uh, universities and high schools uh, about gaming and getting into the industry. And the counterpoint to that is I had done what they needed me to do. I just didn't realize it. And the number one thing any employer wants is the comfort and peace of mind knowing that the person they hire can do the job, which is why they tend to like people with experience. So without realizing it, I had proven I could do the job. They wanted a computer games programmer. Well, look, I'd done that. Mm -hmm. Here, see? I hadn't been doing it with that purpose. But the lesson there is when you want to do something, start doing it. Because that's what's going to get the employer excited about hiring you. You want to get into games? Make games. Whatever kind of games it happens to be. Make them. You want to be a writer? right. You know, you want to do art, make art, whatever it happens to be, do it, because that is the secret to getting in. Yeah, that's really great advice. I teach a lot of classes in professional communication and resume writing and all, all these sorts of things. And, you know, of course, I've talked to a lot of game studio, uh, game developer professionals, and they all say the same thing. There's so many students come out of college thinking, well, I've got a degree. You know, or I went to this program, so that'll be enough, right? Nope. <laughs> no, you need to do, you need to have some stuff to show, a portfolio, you know, stuff you can, like you said, that proves you can do it. Yeah. Now, I was a hiring manager for uh, many years uh, at uh, Bethesda Softworks, and we would get hundreds of resumes, and all of these places are getting all kinds of resumes. You need to find a way to stand out. 
And the best way to do that is be able to show them what you can actually do. You know, otherwise you have to rely on the fact that you are top of your class or you had this special project that you did or, you know, something else to set you apart. But like, look, here's a game I designed on HP 3000. <laughs> Got me my first job. That was my wedge into TSR. TSR is my wedge into video games. Video games are my wedge into novels. I mean, it's all about just keep doing that. What were some of these games you made at the at TSR, the computer? I know they didn't ever said they didn't see the light of day, but it sounded like they were finished or some of them were all the way through the that must have they, been they, frustrating. They did see the light of day. They just oh, they did see they didn't they didn't do they didn't, well. Oh, they didn't, they didn't do, do well. well. I've actually uh, got copies downstairs. I can actually show you the covers if you want. Oh yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. Um since I've finished telling this story, I'll I can run down and get them if you want, or you can wait till a, a good break. Um so we did three games. Uh, we did Dungeon, which was a uh, Apple II Plus version of the Dungeon board game, which was quite popular for mm -hmm. TSR. We did uh, Theseus and the Minotaur, which was an original 3D maze game where you have to avoid, uh, avoid the Minotaur and find the uh, end of the dungeon. And then we did Dawn Patrol, which was probably the most ambitious game, but it was a uh, real-time wireframe uh, World War I dogfighting game uh, using the name of TSR's uh, popular uh, World War I dogfighting board game, Dawn Patrol. Uh, Keith Engie did the uh, uh, Dawn Patrol game and he wrote it in assembly because he needed the speed for it. Uh, but you actually, we were, we took the uh, block out for the wings or and the cockpit was drawn in wireframe and we had a, a whole bunch of different uh, airplanes you could fly and they all had different view areas and different cockpits and different gun configurations and then you see your uh, opponent off in the distance in wireframe and I don't remember the exact numbers but somewhere along the lines of maybe five to eight uh, frames per second Oh, there you go. Look at that. Is this the game? Uh, that's the cover. That is not what the game looked like. You'd need to see screenshots to see what the actual game looked like. There you go. That's what the actual game looked like. So, uh, yeah, but it's, you know, it, it ran it. Yeah, you could, you could see the update. Yeah, you could switch your view to the, uh, any of the five directions. You couldn't look down, but you could look up. And you could see the horizon line, and you'd see your opponent. I mean, it was really ambitious for its time. It was uh, quite an accomplishment. Yeah. He was an amazing programmer. That's probably the only screen I would have saw. <laughs> you saw that screen a lot. Trust me, that was a very common screen. Being <laughs> accuracy zero. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so these were were published. They just for some reason yeah. didn't. Uh... Well, the problem was they didn't know how to market them. So they were just stuffed into Random House's catalog and Random House sold books and they sold books to bookstores and they sold books to hobby stores. And they just tossed these into the catalog along with everything else. And the hobby store said, some of them said, hey, that looks cool, I'll put some in my store. Some of the hobby stores said, I don't deal with computer games because it was still early days. Uh, and bookstores, it was even a, a worse percentage of those who decided to pick them up versus those who decided to take a pass on them. So they didn't sell all that well. Hmm. Um, I think maybe 3,000 copies of each got printed. Now, I'm not 100% sure on that. that. That wasn't in the uh, production side of things. So well, they make your household name, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like me to go get the boxes now or later? Yeah, let's just, I can pause. Okay. I'll go grab them. Hold on. Let's so see. here is the dungeon board game. Oh, that looks awesome. Yep, this is the one that I did. One of the two that I did. And you can see a couple screenshots on the back. Okay. So the, the bottom one is probably the most relevant one. That's the board. It was in the six pieces because the board game was too large to put on a screen. And then you have, uh, uh, is that an ad? I can't see myself what I'm looking at there. 
And then the other game, and this one's still in the shrink wrap. This was uh, Theseus and the Minotaur. This one I also did. Tilt it so that they glow. Artwork on that. That's just. Yeah. And really? that's what that looked like. Theseus and the Minotaur. So, and that was also a ray trace dungeon, but it was drawn from a first person perspective. So, using the same principles of ray tracing. But drawing out the 3D, and it was uh, the dungeon was three stories tall, so there were stairs going up and down. Although the graphics for the stairs were literally just squares in the ceiling and squares in the floor. <laughs> oh, that's too bad. They, you know, if they'd only had some better marketing, you know, these would have. And last but not least, we were talking breaking. about it was uh, Dawn Patrol. Let's see the back cover had some of those same screenshots that you were looking at. Man, those are probably some valuable collectibles you got there. Now, I could probably get tens of dollars for those. <laughs> I'm still on well, the I mean, there's five and a quarter inch floppy disks in there uh, that are 40 years old. So <laughs> I believe the average lifespan of a floppy disk was around five years. So the odds that those were, uh, dang it. Sorry, hold on. Not me. Sorry about that. No worries. Let's see where. What were so, we talking? This is the Dawn Patrol box with some of those same images that you saw on the back. But these uh, five and a quarter inch floppy disks in there. You don't think they would still run? Forty years old, and I think yeah, you have an uh, Apple II somewhere. Or those are Apple span or half life of them was about five years. So yeah, you're not looking at any. Uh, you're probably not going to get to run. Well, there's uh, Apple II Plus, I think, right? Yeah, those are Apple II Plus. Do you have, you don't suppose you have a, <laughs> those computers? I do not. <laughs> you can get simulators, but I don't know how you get it off the uh, disks. And I don't know, I have no idea if anybody's got an archive of them somewhere. I'm always amazed at uh, software archaeology to uh, semi coin a term, the uh, way some of these guys can. Uh, you know, I wouldn't be surprised at all if I could find those. And that, I mean, they're on Moby Games, so somebody found it. <laughs> true, true. Uh, well, let's see. So, yeah, you're there after these computer games. You did some, uh, I guess you got to work with a lot of people I consider to be the greats, right? <laughs> Market-wise. Yes. Or Hickman. I mean, it's incredible. I mean, these names that you've seen on all your favorite products. Uh, I guess some work on Dragonlance. Which Just I'm a little bit. Just a little bit. I mean, everybody's read those, I hope. Uh, yeah, but then I mean, there got... were 16 modules. So, you know, everybody got to uh, dip their toe in that water if they wanted. Uh, but somewhere we get to this bed. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I think it's Clyde Caldwell on that. That uh, is absolutely Clyde Caldwell. What? Oh, my. Come on. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Weighs about a ton. Yeah, it does. It doesn't look <laughs> that heavy. But... <laughs> wow. I'm impressed you have the original box. You know, I found a, I mean, every now and then you'll find a cell where somebody's getting rid of all their, their stuff. And I love this set because it's, it's so obviously been played to death, you know, all the materials and notes that I think it was a DM that was getting rid of his, he had a, I think a new kid and he was like, we don't have enough room for all this stuff. And I'm like, you know, I, I think I could take care of that for you. <laughs> <laughs> and I love the interior uh, layout design. I think it's, it was very evocative for its time. Games are just starting to play with a uh, fun layout. Oh yeah, um, I was looking at those. They look a lot like uh, a computer game the way that, let me see if I can find that, what you're talking about. Well, I'm talking about if you open the book, the black outline and the art oh, style. Oh. And all of that uh, is very evocative. Looking and like games, these uh, sort of. Oh yeah, these sort of things look a lot like a, a game, a computer game layout from. Yeah. Well, well and you know we have uh, Tracy Hickman to thank for all of that because uh, his original Ravenloft module, yeah, picture there was the uh, this inspiration for that box set. I mean, he insisted on a brand new orthogonal, uh, not orthogonal, but. Uh, uh, a brand new 3D, pseudo 3D map. I'm not sure what this is, like a transparency. I guess uh, this is to lay, maybe you yeah. lay this on top of the map. Lay it on top of your, yeah. Wow. 
So this is a, you know, I know a lot of people are familiar with this. How did you uh, end up designing this? Well, they decided that they wanted a new campaign setting and Tracy Hickman's uh, Ravenloft module was our best selling module bar none. And so Vampire the Masquerade had just come out and was a hit. So oh. it was, hey, let's, you know, we got to take advantage of this. We got our own property here. That's uh, something that people would really want to play in. And I was fortunate enough to get the call to do it. I did lobby for it. Um, and uh, so they gave it to me. And Andrea Heyday and I, Andrea was the editor, but her work on it was so critical and important that we gave her author credit because she went way above and beyond. Um, uh, put that together. And you know, like I say, the, uh, the look of the inside of the book was championed by her and it's fantastic. Yes, it is. Uh, we got a completely new art style. You know, the pictures on the inside we had a very Gothic feel in contrast to the photorealism that was, yeah, the photorealism <laughs> that was uh, popular at the time. You know, the uh, Jeff Easley and Larry Elmore and Clyde Caldwell type of art. My favorite so, type of work. I noticed in here you have a suggested reading list. And <laughs> yep. 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 All the classics. Shirley Jackson, The Haunting of Hill House. Frankenstein, of course. Dracula, of course. Yeah. Well, we wanted to emphasize the Gothic roots. Uh, Vampire the Masquerade was taking a very modern approach. It was vampires in the modern age. Hmm. And, you know, to distinguish ourselves, that was the way to do it, was to say that. Plus, it fit with the whole Ravenloft theme. I mean, Ravenloft is a Gothic horror adventure. Hmm. So, kind of got to. Yeah, you know, I was trying to think of Anne Rice. Was she? I guess she. Her novels were. Were they popular at this time? I don't... No, they came afterward. They came, came after afterward. this. Yeah. So that vampire. Did you ever play those uh, Ravenloft uh, computer games? I did play them a little bit. The uh, uh, SSI ones you're talking about. Yeah. 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 No. Uh, SSI computer games were a, a big deal for TSR in those days, and I played a little bit of the Ravenloft one to see. If uh, how it played out. I mean, it was literally just the castle. It was the module without anything but the castle in it, if I remember correctly. Yeah, surprised they didn't. Nobody thought about contacting you to work on this. Or... <laughs> you, you've kind of had periods where you weren't weren't in the games industry, right? You I did. I did. Uh, the late '80s, I was uh, largely out of uh, TSR. Yeah, I've played these a little bit. So you, were you impressed with them? Yeah, I was. Uh, the SSI games, uh, I mean, they're were, they were very cookie cutter in a lot of ways. If you played one, you played them all. But they had a, a great system to apply their cookie cutter to. So you really felt like you were in the room. And given that nobody had ever done anything like that before, it was uh, you know very exciting and very immersive. You know, nothing compared to what you, they have these days, but for those days, nobody got to see what the inside of the room looked like from an artist's point of view. I wonder, have you played those vampire, the masquerade games? From... Yes, I have. Yes, I have. I've played a lot of role-playing games. Those are games. scary. <laughs> <laughs> well, they were interested in uh, politics and vampire noir. Um, it's a very cool game and a very cool game system. And I'm, I'm a big fan of uh, vampire and werewolf. Uh, I also dabbled a little bit with Mage, but, um, you know, but they were much more of the vampires in the here and now in the modern world and how they hide themselves from uh, modern society and then all the politicking. It had, had origins in uh, live action role playing, I've always assumed. I know after it came out, a lot of people adapted it for live action role playing, but you know, it was very, very story driven and ours was a little more action driven. Well, I wanted to, I got a question from a Chris while we're still, while we're kind of in this area about a game called uh, Dragon Strike. Oh yeah. And specifically he was interested in this video. <laughs> 
Oh, yes. The video. Great, by the way, I, I was really entertained by this video. <laughs> I was actually there for the filming of that and uh, directed the editing of it. So this was kind of just a pack in or bonus item or was it part of the game? Well, what we were trying to do with the game, and actually now that I recall, I wasn't there for the filming of that. I was there for the editing of it and for some of the other pieces. Um, what we were looking to do with that was to introduce D&D to a younger audience. Uh, mm -hmm. TSR was always on the lookout to uh, push younger and younger because the market research that we did showed that the earlier you started playing, the more likely you were to play when you were older. I mean, it seems like an obvious thing to say, but, you know, people who waited to play until they were 17, yeah, they dabbled and then they dropped out. You know, you wanted somebody who was going to really get into it and buy a lot of games. You needed to get them when they were in middle school. Like a lifelong wow. fan. Yeah, 11, 12, 13. And Dragon Strike was an attempt to push that even lower and get kids who are below 11 interested in the ideas. So we wanted something that would grab them. And a videotape seemed like a very natural thing. You know, you buy this game, you open up the game rules. Well, mom and dad or your older brother and sister have to read it to you because, you know, you're nine or 10 years old and you don't have the attention span or to... Uh, understand that so but what you can do is you can put in this videotape and wow look you know this is exciting and energetic and you know obviously it's geared towards a younger audience since you've watched the tape you know what i'm talking about <laughs> and uh it's fun video it is it is a fun video but it's, it's definitely more juvenile than your traditional audience for dungeons and dragons at the time and that wasn't that was uh, by intent so yeah. And, the, you know, and then you get a sense for, you know, the various things that you can do. And then when you go to play the board game, you've got something to work with. Yeah, it's looking at this, an impressive amount of uh, stuff. Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Now, wow. I'm, I'm pretty proud of the work I did on that game. The, the combat system in particular, because we, we needed something really, really dirt simple. So, you know um i did two games i did that and first quest and if i remember correctly this is the one where in order to strike you just rolled a uh a die if you got a four or higher you hit and the idea was that the size of the die you rolled indicated how good you were so if you had a 10-sided die you're definitely going to have a better chance of rolling a four or above than if you rolled a six-sided die so that's going for a hundred dollars on this uh, <laughs> this auction. I yeah. think it's gonna be a lot more money because it's got to be rare to have a, a version with all the pieces. Like yeah, with all the pieces in a functional videotape, probably, yeah, probably. Yeah, here's the. Yeah, I noticed there's a video by I think it's Pro Jared or something like that, and he was talking about this. Have you seen? I don't know if you've seen his video where he talks about this game and the VHS. I don't think I have. No. But he was, uh, he kept talking about how there's two thieves. Yes. Or if a thief, a wizard, and like one thief is male, the other is female. What was, did, I don't know if you designed this part of it or what was the, why are well, there We two? wanted to have six characters and we kind of felt like the thief was more interesting we also needed to have a female character. Uh, TSR in those days was very much struggling with uh, diversity, at that time, gender diversity uh, in their products. So we didn't want to have the thief be female. We didn't want to have any one of the characters be female. So whatever one we were going to have a female character for, there was going to be a male alternate. And so we chose Thief. I don't remember all the thinking in Thief versus Warrior or whatever, but that's the... Yeah, I don't think there's a cleric in, the, in those cards, is it? No, we didn't want to deal with the whole healing thing. We were uh, staying, trying to stay away from uh, religion in any way, shape, or form in there. <laughs> Probably a smart idea. <laughs> uh, yeah, try, I remember I, I played a game back then called uh, Hero Quest, I believe was the name of it. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Was it, was that out around the same time? Was that competition? Yes, it was. Actually, they were out first. And uh, TSR, who's, you know, 
was always good at seeing what other people did well and trying to uh, hop on that train, uh, said, well, HeroQuest, this is a great game. And HeroQuest was a great game. Uh, said, well, you know, we should make one of these for ourselves and use it to introduce kids to role-playing and role-playing concepts. And so that's that, that was a lot of the uh, background for Dragon Strike. All right, well, I think it's probably time to move into your time at Bethesda. So it wasn't too long. It says 1995 on Wikipedia. Does that sound about right? Yeah, that sounds about right. Since you contributed to one of my favorites, The Elder Scrolls II Daggerfall. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> the <laughs> game that almost killed us and pretty much killed the original studio. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it was, you know, like a year and a half later, something insane like that. I think it was nine months late. It was a long time ago, but it was very, very late. Uh, Bethesda at that time was a small boutique studio. And to have the kind of overrun on time that that game had, you know, it was just, that put a financial stake in the heart of the game and the heart of the company. And, you know, they ended up selling themselves to uh, ZeniMax uh, as a result. But now Daggerfall, that was uh, Julian LeFay and Ted Peterson's baby. And I was just fort fortunate enough to uh, be able to do some substantial work on it with them. Yeah, this is a, a classic. I was reading some of your inter interviews and I think it was RPG Gamer, a couple other ones. And you were talking there about the much later, you know, of course, the Radiant and the story system and all that. But I, I, I always think a lot about Daggerfall. Uh, in those regards, because I, I just remember so many friends of mine that played this, they would tell me stories about like what happened to them in the game. It was like all this unique stuff and sometimes just crazy, absurd things that would happen. <laughs> yeah, yep. that was part of the beauty of it. So, and, you know, the scale and the scope of it were, you know, staggering. Yeah, there you are. Staggering. Yeah, that's me. That's a horrible picture of me, but that's me. What all did you do on this? Oh, Lord. Um, I did the introductory dungeon. That was my work. Uh, I did uh, some of the creature stats. Uh, it was a very small team, so I ended up consulting on a lot of stuff on it. Uh, it makes it hard to dissect, you know, I did A, yes. but not B. Uh, but I worked pretty closely with uh, Julian LeFay, uh, implemented some of the main quest. Um, I worked on the character system. Uh, that was, I believe, some of the origin for what we later went on to do with the, if you do it, you get better at it. But the whole flexible character system, uh, creation system was already in place from Ted and Julian at that point. Uh, but I uh, did some definite development work on that. Made some of the quests. Uh, the quest editor was, uh, we'll be kind and use the word primitive, <laughs> um, but it worked. I mean, we were able to uh, pump that product out and uh, and make the game with it. And I think it's really awesome to play even the I played not too long ago, and it was quite a bit of fun. <laughs> you know, the randomness is, is part of the charm, I think. Oh yeah. Well, and uh, I didn't realize I that. Let's give a shout cool. out to uh, Hal Boma as well. Uh, the game as shipped could not be completed. It was broken. And Hal was one of the programmers there and he put in heroic after hours work to fix all the bugs and make it so you could actually finish the game. And I don't think he was the only one, but he was the principal one who was working on it to do that. I guess that's the problem when you do something really truly innovative and ambitious. It's <laughs> very difficult to work out all of the or even anticipate all the problems that people might might have yep. something like that. But, yep. and just as this is an aside i just on wikipedia here it says you also worked on the terminator uh yeah they did a uh series? what is skynet was the name of the game it was a terminator franchise uh i did quite a bit of work on skynet actually skynet that was the name of the actual product that we did yeah i don't know if i'm familiar with that one yeah, had a uh, a gold yellow cover with a Terminator robot on it, but I think they had um, 
Oh, there you go. That's it. Yeah. Action game. 3D shooter, huh? Yep. So mm -hmm. it was pretty good. But Bethesda did, I think, three Terminator games. This was the, I believe, the final one. But, you know, classic Doom style, uh, Doom style game. You know, run around, shoot things, pick up better guns, go shoot some more things. Is there a bit of? It looks like there's a bit of a role playing aspect to it there with the. A little bit, yeah. Uh, that was starting to creep into a lot of games at that time. It looks like a lot of fun. It was good. That was a good game. So then you didn't you didn't work on the uh, moral win. I did just a little bit of uh, freelance work on it, like just the barest minimum, but I was not with the studio when they were doing Morrowind. But you did work on Oblivion. Oh yeah, I did a lot of work on Oblivion. And notice that's one of those interviews you said your favorite quest you ever designed. I, I have to agree, I think it is really good. The, not the one in the game, but the expansion Shivering Isles where the, yep. you know, those ghosts and the recurring battles. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yep. No, that was one of those where you get this wild hair idea and you have to implement it and it's you know five times more difficult than it should have been uh, already being three times more difficult than you than you ought to have made it so it was a it was a real bear to get to work i was fighting the system at every step but uh, eventually we did get it to work that's one of those that sticks around in people's memories i'm sure yep um, I believe was the name of the place. Yeah, let me get some shots up here. I don't know if they'll have the shots of the, that particular part of it, but I'll oh, probably not now. Yeah, I think this is the game, really the Oblivion. You know, I played, I was, you know, I, I love Morrowind when that came out, but I don't remember just seemed like everybody knew about <laughs> Oblivion. <laughs> Like well, this Oblivion really put the best really on them. Yeah. Yeah. That's the, uh, that, that was the, uh, the big game that was like, holy cow, this is everything I ever wanted to play in a computer role playing game. Morrowind was very close to that, but it just didn't receive the same attention for whatever reason. Um, but Morrowind's success gave attention to Oblivion and allowed it to become uh, just an amazing game. You know, I've always thought maybe at this time, since it was released in 2006, I mean, that was definitely, yeah, the th Xbox 360 was out. Mm -hmm. This is really the period where, to me, it seemed like there wasn't a whole lot of difference anymore from consoles to computers in terms of, like, graphics and what they could do. No, not really. Uh, that was an age still of uh, parity between consoles and uh, the PC, and then later on, consoles overwhelmed pc and then the pendulum swung back again uh but we were slated i believe to be a launch title for the 360 but uh, delays we delayed ended up delaying six months and that could not have been better for us and as a result bethesda decided that they never wanted to be a launch title ever again but of course now they're owned by microsoft so i don't know if they have the, the option <laughs> yeah but, uh, you know, at the time that that six months delay allowed for a lot of 360s to get in a lot of people's hands so that when we did release, we had what for the time was an enormous initial ship, uh, which was just phenomenal and wonderful for, uh, for us. And then it continued to sell. It had legs for years. It was amazing how long that continued to sell. Yeah, it really didn't. Uh... Got eclipsed until the Skyrim. Skyrim to this day is still one of the most played games on Xbox systems. Today, yeah. more people will play Skyrim than will play some 90% of games on their system. That that is just stunning to me. Just <laughs> stunning that that's really true. Really amazing. Uh, I was looking here on Steam a while ago at their, you know, their top sellers on the pc and you know there's of course i'm actually surprised it's this this low quote unquote <laughs> but, you know, still look, at the, look at the price on that 
$39.99. Yeah, I mean, it's just unheard of, right? Unheard of. Over 10 years old. Admittedly, that's the special edition. So it's got all the cool extra bonus stuff put into it. But still, over 10 years old, and they can still sell it for $40. I, I'm, I, could, I struggle to think of very many other games that that's true for. It's just a, a stunning. I don't know if there's really game. anything else. I mean, this is, a, you, know, you know, of course, I wrote a book co-authored with, the, with Shane, you know, about the history of computer role-playing games. And I mean, I think if you would have asked me 10 years ago, what do you think we'll be playing <laughs> You know, 20, uh, 22 and you know who would have thought well we'll still be playing elder schools five uh, skyrim yeah i would have assumed i don't know about you i would have assumed that'd be like elder schools nine or ten by now and we would be playing that instead uh it is one of the one of the things that is a, a personal disappointment that we didn't do elder Scrolls six sooner uh, you know, the studio had had needs and other things that they needed and wanted to do. And so they delayed it in order to be able to accomplish those goals. And God bless our fans. Uh, you know, they stuck by Skyrim for over 10 years. And that means that when Elder Scrolls 6 does come out, it's going to it's going to be a monster. It's just going oh, to be a monster. God. What do you uh, I had a question from a friend of mine, Max, about Skyrim and yeah, he was talking about the same thing. It's just such a loyal following, extensive modding community. Mm -hmm. So what do you think, from your perspective as a designer, that led to that longevity? One of the things that we tried to be is something you really shouldn't do. And that is we tried to be all things to all men, uh, which is usually the kiss of death on a game. We just, we just got goddamn lucky, quite honestly. Um, but it has everything in it. The immersion value is off the charts. And it also came out at the right time. The Lord of the Rings movies were coming out then. Uh, and, you know, right place, right time, right product. But when you can go play Skyrim and every time you look at a mountain or you see something on the other end of a forest, you know you can go there, that there is nothing stopping you, that the world is completely and utterly open and huge. You know, that's massively attractive, massively attractive. And you have to remember, open world games weren't much of a thing. Bethesda was really one of the only companies doing them. Uh, certainly not the only one, but we were the big player in that, you know? and. You look five years later, everybody's bragging about open world. Everybody's got open world this, open world that. But Skyrim, you know, did it did it best. You know, Oblivion did it first and Skyrim did it best. When you look at these, I mean, of oh, yeah, <laughs> course, the, you know, enhanced or special edition or, or whatever. But oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, you look at this, you know, it looks like a painting, but, you know, just thinking, well, I could go over there and check that mountain now, and there's some kind of ruins. You know, you always like love uh, seeing something way off in the distance, and you just kind of sucked in. You want to go explore. You know, I've always, you know, you talk to people that read fantasy and Tolkien, and, you know, it's one of the things you, you most hear from those folks is, God, you know, this, this would be heaven to me, you know, to live in Middle Earth, <laughs> you know, get to oh, go. Well, and you and feel like this. The story is yours. Yes, it feels like you're in control. Place. You're determining the pace. You're determining what happens next. Mm -hmm. Other games didn't do that. Other games were, here's our story. You do it in the order we give it to you with these potential branches, you know, and then throw on top of there the art. And, oh my God, Bethesda has the best artists. The, the quality of the art is just spectacular. Um, and that contributes to the immersion factor. I mean, you really, really feel like you are there. Um, you know, and in the expansions, you can, you know, get the houses or you can buy a house and decorate it. And that's a staple now. I mean, you can't almost can't make any kind of Nopal World game unless you allow the, the player to have a house that they can decorate. It's you know, unheard of to, to not do that. Um, so, you know, it's. It, it is all things to all men. You know, you get to be the character you want to be. You, it, it's immersive. The game system gets out of your way for the most part. You're not, you don't have to pay attention to it if you don't want to. The growth potential, you're continually improving your character for 
tens and hundreds of hours of gameplay. I mean, what's not to love? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's a reason it's still you know selling so well, right? Oh yeah, oh yeah. And I, you know, I was, you know, God bless Todd Howard. He uh, let me be the uh, lead designer for Skyrim, and uh, I put a lot of time and effort into that game. And a lot of the work you see there, you know, I had my fingers in one way or the other. So, you know, you had a lot to do with the uh, the radiant. Kurt Coleman and I story uh, tag teamed on the Radiant uh, uh, story system. Uh, Todd had the Genesis idea for that, but it was kind of an organic outgrowth. There was kind of lots of people, you know, things were just kind of heading that way. And he crystallized and said, this is what we need to do. Uh, it was a very famous little diagram he made to, to show that off, which I've used in some of my college presentations. But uh, uh, Kurt and I tag teamed on it, and I do an, an actually an entire uh, talk about Radiant Story System. When, uh, yeah, I saw that. It's on, good on occasions when I go to uh, speak at, at universities. Uh, the magic system was all new. Uh, Todd was a little dubious that we needed something new, but I persuaded him, and he said, "Okay, go ahead and make me something completely new." So I, you know, threw out the baby in the bathwater and did something new. Uh, we fine-tuned the character system so that it was even better at you just do it and you get better at it without all the weird quirkiness that Morrowind and Oblivion had. You now the uh, the leveling and opponent, uh, uh, how your opponents were geared to your difficulty level was improved dramatically. Uh, it's it was just it was all in there. I was wondering how you would compare the way that the sort of procedural generation aspects of uh, Skyrim to what you saw or contributed to in Daggerfall. Oh, wow. You got like way back. <laughs> some of that inspirational or? Well, um, procedural generation had been something that everybody had been talking about for a long time. Mm -hmm. It was a backroom hot topic in computer games, you know, forever. It was sort of this holy grail of, well, if we can get the computer to create the content, we can dramatically expand the amount of content we make. And the technology just couldn't do it up until about Skyrim's time. Right about the time Skyrim came out, we actually had enough processing power and the technology was good enough that we could actually make a serious stab at it. And you know, make no mistake, it's an expensive system. And if you look at the Fallout games that followed, they dialed back on uh, Radiant Story stuff uh, significantly. It's still there, but they didn't do a lot of the things that were done in Skyrim. And they pushed the uh, Radiant Story in other directions, You know, wonderful directions for what they were, but they weren't the same procedural content directions. So, you know, but we really, went hard at the idea of the world will react to the things you do. Uh, and this was something that I, to this day, I don't know of other games that have done it. I'm sure there's some out there that I'm not aware of, but the idea that I go drop some items in the street and two random dudes will come over and start fighting about it. And then a guard comes over and breaks up the fight. That doesn't happen anywhere else. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know other games where that happens. You know, you, you kill some random person and the relative of them, set up as a relative of them at the beginning of the game, comes and seeks you out or sends someone to punish you. You know, you cast some spells and some apprentice comes running up and wants you to teach him those spells because you cast them. Having the world react to you so that you are even more the star of it. You know, you look at most of these other games and they're very static. The world sits doing nothing, waiting for you to be the, uh, the actor, the instigator, uh, to push things along. And when you go away, it stops interacting. Nothing is happening. The world is static unless you're uh, there. And Skyrim didn't do that. The world is not static if you're not there. Yeah, I mean, it really sounds almost like Skyrim is sort of the equival equivalent of having a really good and attentive dm i like to say it's having the world's worst dm 
The worst DM. Absolute worst DM. <laughs> okay, you got to explain that one. But having the world's worst DM is in the computer system is better than having no DM at all. Okay. Any human could do better than what Skyrim did as a DM. <laughs> but no computer has done better than Skyrim has done as a DM. <laughs> How's that? Well, do you think it's uh, just the, kind of the limitation of computers in general? Or is it something that might eventually be... Oh, no, no. I think the Radiant Story system proved computers can do it. Uh, but what has to happen is you have to want to invest in that side of things. Um, the investment both in code and in design to implement the Radiant Story system. Uh, the technology is still there in all subsequent Bethesda products. In fact, it's tr tremendously better. But you also have to invest on the design side. Somebody's got to create all these little vignettes. They have to be vetted by QA. They have to fit into the world. Um, you can do that or you can do something else. You can't do both. You have a limited amount of resources in both in time, personnel, and talent. And so you have to make the choice, is this what we want to do? And we made that choice in Skyrim to do that. And most games these days would rather make story-driven content that is directed. And to be fair, that tends to get a better reception from most players. They tend to want that more. They don't really want procedural content. This is something that we discovered when we were making, uh, making Skyrim was that the players don't want that. They want cool stories that they can immerse themselves in which is why you see a lot of the Radiant Story stuff filling in the cracks of the world rather than driving the primary story. The primary story is your classic, we've created a story, you followed the way we told you to, but the world interacts with you using these systems. I know a lot of people that don't even pay much attention to the main quest, you know, they get drawn into all this other stuff you can do. Yeah, they get drawn into the drama. No, it's, we actually, uh, and I don't remember the numbers anymore, it's been too long, but we did a, a study for how many people followed the main quest out of the initial uh, dungeon, you know, when you get out of, the, out of the city, out of the cave, and how many decided to go some other direction. And it was a phenomenal number of people that did what we called at the time, you know, a hard left. You know, they, they, most of them literally turned left, but you could also go right if you wanted, uh, said, nope, over there is Riverwood and I'm being told to go to Riverwood and I'm not going to. <laughs> and they turned left and they went off and did something else and spent 50 hours playing the game and never going to Riverwood. <laughs> There's a lot of people here that can relate to that. And we were okay with that. Well, that's and the cool thing. Like you're okay. I can't tell you many games that would be okay with that, but we were okay with that. Well, what about a, a Skyrim 6? Was there... Did well, you know, what, the, would they, what would your Skyrim 6 look like? <laughs> what would my Skyrim 6 yeah, look would like? Yeah, okay, that's what, a better would question. Or what, what would you? Because I am, I am not going to steal Bethesda's thunder <laughs> on uh, Elder Scrolls 6. And no, 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 no. That and Starfield are topics I cannot and won't talk about. But what I would do on Skyrim, on uh, Elder Scrolls 6, is I would probably try to go back to those radiant story roots and see if we could make the world feel even more alive. Um, because that, that living feel of it, I think is what gave it those long legs, you know, the feel that mm -hmm. everything is actually there. You know, if you look at, uh, fallout, for example, the, uh, fault three and fallout four, the vendors and the townsfolk for the most part stand in one location all day long. And that's my intent so that they have, the player can find them without having to work for it. Well, in Skyrim, all the vendors at night pack their stuff up, go to their houses, and they actually have houses, and they go sleep in their beds. And then they come back out and they open up their shop the next day at a particular hour. And that puts a certain amount of friction between you and the game. You know, you wanna go sell something at midnight? Sorry, you're gonna to have to wait until sunrise. The store is not open. You know, whereas in Fallout, you want to sell stuff at midnight? Yeah, go ahead, Fall. You know, you can go sell it. It makes the game more open and more uh, accessible. But what it does is it removes that extra layer of making it feel like a living world. 
you know, it removes just that little bit of immersion. So it's not that one's right or one's wrong. It's, it's a choice. And for me, because it's Elder Scrolls, I would push back in that direction again. I would try to make the world even more like a truly living organism. I feel like it's there. You know, I look at Assassin's Creed and the stuff they did with cities and making them feel like they were really alive with all the figures wandering around. I'd love to see something like that. We'd have to sacrifice that you can talk to anybody, but that'd be okay. Um, but that's that's where I would that's where I would push it. You know, I like this vision. <laughs> <laughs> Make this happen. This is, sounds great. Well, I'm retired, so that'll have to be someone else's decision. Oh, we can talk about it. And there's a how much money do you? Have? <laughs> Uh, you, I know you worked a little bit on those the, the Fallout games, right? And I don't know what, I guess there's three different ones we can talk about, but do you have a, you know thoughts on that series too? I, I was, one of the interesting things about that to me is, you know, there was already Fallout 1 and 2. Yep. Like some of those designers. And then, of course, the isometric, completely different kind of game uh, than Fallout, or, you know, the rest of the Fallout games. Uh, I've always been a little curious what it was like from Bethesda's perspective. Oh, the hate that we got from certain small but vocal quarters about <laughs> us doing fallout you, oh. you cannot believe the vitriol it was it's just just staggering wow really yes no one you well, they didn't know. want they didn't want uh they wanted fallout 3 to be like fallout 2 they wanted it to be quirky they wanted it to be their game and not a mass marketed game because games that are niche when people like them they feel like they have ownership they feel like they belong to an exclusive club and they wanted that and they were also afraid legitimately so that some of the more um anti-social parts of that those games that really push the envelope we would not be able to be put into a game that had more mass market uh, reach. You know, you couldn't deal with some of the more taboo topics. Uh, and, and we didn't, we avoided some of them, but we had more than people thought we would. But fortunately, most of the audience was so excited for Skyrim with guns, which is how we were kind of positioning the game. That floated most people's boats. And, you know, we were seeing what this was looking like as we were building it. And we knew this was going to be something truly amazing. You know, nobody had done an immersive, truly open world game like that. Uh, and bringing the wasteland to life. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I was fortunate enough to do some quests in Fallout 3 and do a lot of systems work on Fallout 3. Most of the character progression stuff is mine. Most of the creature stats uh, and uh, creature capabilities are mine. Uh, a lot of the economy is mine. Uh, so, I keep forgetting to mention you did some of the work on the monstrous manuals and compendiums, right, back to Oh yeah, I did a lot of that. This is you've been doing this for a long time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've I've got a rather uh, lengthy resume, as they say. So, I mean, this was, uh, you know, this was a, this was a game that really, really pushed the envelope in a new way. A lot of the stuff that came from uh, Oblivion got repurposed here. You know, the whole open world set, trying to make it feel like you were really there, uh, uh, a reduced but focused uh, radiant story system, you know, the underlying mechanics of how we created things in Radiant Story were dramatically improved, but we focused on certain aspects of things to uh, make them better. Uh, and then the VAT system, which I had very little to do with. Actually, that's not true. I did, I did do a lot of the math in the VAT system, but Todd largely directed the VAT system himself. Um, yeah, you know, it's, you know, it, it was, it was revolutionary in its own way. I'm so. I don't know what the sales figures are like for. I'm kind of curious where. <laughs> and it's. I mean, obviously it was a big hit at the time, but is, how does it compare to? In terms of initial sales, you know, first week sales, yeah. each one of these games outsold the previous one. So, uh, Morrowind outsold 
uh, Dagger Fall, Oblivion outsold Morrowind, Fallout 3 outsold Oblivion, uh, Elder Scrolls 5, Skyrim outsold Fallout 3, Fallout 4 outsold Skyrim. Skyrim has the longest legs. It continued to sell longer and deeper than any of the others. But that's not to say that Fallout 3 and Fallout 4 did not have amazing legs. You know, we're talking tens of millions of copies of all the games starting from uh, uh, Skyrim, Fallout 4. I think Fallout 3 managed to crack 10 as well. But, you know, they all were tens of millions of sales and some of the best selling games of their generation, to be honest. I bet everybody probably has these in there collection somewhere nope. <laughs> you've got to play at least once <laughs> oh if, if you haven't played one of the fallout titles you you just are not you're really missing out on something if you haven't played skyrim you are really missing out on something these are these are seminal games that if you like uh playing video games for long periods of time you really have to play them they're really up there with the, the top 10 of everybody's games what about the fallout 76 that's the newest one all at 76 was an attempt to do something completely different. And uh, it took a while for it to find its audience, but it did find it. And it's a very successful game now. But the idea was let's do multiplayer. Uh, the problem was that sounded really easy and turned out to be outrageously difficult. Hmm. Like an order of magnitude more difficult than the studio anticipated. And so as a result, in order to get it out at all, uh, it had to get streamlined pretty significantly. And so it took a lot of updates before all the features that you expect to see in a Bethesda game were able to be included in there. Um, so for instance, when it first shipped, its main quest was extremely thin because the idea was, well, people aren't gonna wanna play a story, they're gonna wanna do PVP. That's what the game's all about, right? Well, imagine the shock when people didn't want to do PvP. They wanted to do PvE. They wanted to play solo against the environment. And they wanted to know why there weren't any NPCs to talk to. And where, were the, where was the big story? And this doesn't feel like the game I wanted to play. Because uh, what they wanted was they wanted to play co-op. They didn't want to play PvP. So that had to be put in. And you know, if you play 76 today, it's got a great main story and it does uh, an amazing job of uh, co-op gameplay. But it, it took them uh, a couple of years of updates to get to where that could be the case. That's a shame when the game, you know, it's kind well, of the initial, initial reaction that kind of taints, I yeah. guess, the, the follow-up even. <laughs> Go back and play it today. <laughs> well, it's the risk you run when you try and do something really new and different. You know, trying to do co-op and PvP, because co-op was always, always in there from the beginning. It just, we didn't see it as the focus. Um, when you try and do something like that, the odds of you stumbling are much, much higher. Uh, and we weren't used to stumbling. Bethesda didn't know how to do anything but make a hit. You know, since the days of Morrowind, every game that Bethesda made was a ginormous hit. And so the idea that 76 wouldn't just be as enormous a hit, just, it just didn't even occur to us. Mm. <laughs> you know, and that was our hubris. You know, that was, that was our mistake. We, we have to own that because <laughs> that's so patently wrong. It's not even funny. Like there is some significant soul searching going on. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Anytime, anytime something doesn't meet expectations, and I have, I have great lines about expectations. Uh, then there's got to be. I mean, we always were really good at looking at the games we did and try to figure out how to do it better and how to get rid of the things that went wrong. Um, you know, we always do postmortems of the games. But you know, seventy six. And it wasn't like it was a failure. It's not a failure. It's, it's a very successful game right now. It just took a little bit longer to find its feet and for us to dial it into the, where it needed to be. Uh, one of my favorite, expect, uh, favorite expressions is the game of expectations. As you are never judged by the actual work you do. You are judged 
against the expectation. Hmm. And this is why you see a lot of sales and marketing people talk about managing expectations. So if I make a game, the expectation is here. If my 10 year old cousin makes a game, the expectation is here. If he meets that expectation, he is praised. If I fail this expectation, but I make here, oh. I am vilified. But my game is objectively better than his, but I failed to make expectations. Okay. And you can apply that to every facet of life. You go into a fancy restaurant, your expectation for the meal you get is here. And if they deliver here, you're upset. Even though when you go into McDonald's and they deliver here, you're happy. So oh, it's like the game of expectations. It's it's the it's the one game that's played in real life that you have to pay attention to. Sounds like you can sort of become a victim of your own success and have such a high bar to live up to. I can't. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, and oh, you created guys the guys How are you gonna, you know, surpass yeah. that? Uh, <laughs> Well, and the guys at Bethesda, you know, and Todd Howard in particular, you know, they're keenly aware of that and they work really hard to manage expectations. But there's only so much you can do. I mean, you know, with Skyrim, Fallout 3 and Fallout 4, no marketing manager could dial expectations back. It just was not humanly possible. So I got a game that was objectively good and a success was not seen as one. And we had to, you know, make course corrections. And all credit goes to uh, uh, Todd and the team and uh, uh, the company admin side for being willing to put in the effort to make those course corrections because a lot of other companies would have decided to just pull the plug and bail on a game that uh, didn't meet their expectations. Well, what's next for you? Uh... Bruce, I know you're going to That's what's next for another me. couple of books to go for. Uh, <laughs> yep. my, this is a trilogy. Uh, the, I seem to remember seeing this was a. The, it's uh, going to be one of those fourth or fifth editions of their fourth or fifth books in the trilogy kind of situation, or is it going to be a hard. Well, stop? right now I'm looking at doing three. Until I'm done with the third one, I can't tell you for sure that'll be the end of it. But right now that's what I'm looking at. Uh, the second book, Odin's Escape is out of my hands and is in the hands of my publisher. So that should actually be released, you know, very soon. Um, you know, hopefully within the next couple of weeks, but since I'm not in total control of that, I, I can't guarantee it. And I've uh, just started working on the third one. Wow, you're prolific, fast. <laughs> well, it takes, takes me about a year to write. And I remember you telling uh, Shane about how fast you you guys had to crank out those modules and Oh, campaigns. I mean, that must, some of that work ethic must still be, uh, <laughs> you must still have some of that. I have all of it. <laughs> I mean, that's a lot of, uh, I mean, this came out in 20, April, 2021. Of course, I, I yeah. don't know. How long did it take you to write this? That particular one was a little over two years. Okay. Um, Cause you have to remember I was working full time. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I was writing this on weekends, um, and uh, I also spent some time uh, trying to see if, uh, you know, working on the publishing side of it, uh, since I was brand new to, to all of this. So that one, took, that one took longer to wrap up because of that. Uh, the second book, Odin's Escape, uh, I was already retired. I was able to uh, spend uh, full-time writing it. So it took about a year and you know, mine, you won't find it up there. <laughs> it's not oh. listed yet. Won't, won't be listed until it's actually available in a uh, couple, three weeks. No pre-order. <laughs> no, not yet. You know, that's uh, Craig Martell's uh, uh, side of the business. He decides when it's good to do that or not good, not do that. But uh, so I, I, uh, I like to enjoy my retirement since I'm able to do so. So uh, other authors could probably knock out the books much faster. But for me, it's probably going to be about a year, of, uh, a year of book. It sounds like you're having fun. Yeah, yeah, I'm enjoying it. It's, uh, it's my chance to have yet another career. 
uh, you know, we didn't even talk about and probably shouldn't about my non-gaming careers, of which I've had a couple. So I just uh, I was thinking about your novel or your novel novel writing and sort of all the other jobs you've had over the years. And I remember reading somewhere you talked about somebody that asked you, well, what about how does board games and computer games, how does that compare? And you had said something like, well, the what you liked about working on the board games was that you just there was a smaller team and you had a lot more sort of direct control over it uh -huh. by more like your vision. So I always thought the ultimate form of that's writing a novel because I mean, of course you got an editor, but <laughs> you know, aside from that, it's your baby. Uh, you definitely have more direct ownership. Um, you know, if you uh, are fortunate enough to have a developmental editor, uh, they really help you a lot with your book and you know, help direct you away from things that are bad that you can't see are bad and towards things that are good that you haven't seen are good yet. But uh, yeah, you have a much, much higher level of ownership. You know, a board game, you could have that, you might not. It depends a lot on the, uh, the game you're making and the environment in which you're making it. A lot of independent board game makers, you know, they own their babies completely. You work for you know a top-notch company like Fantasy Flight. Well, yeah, okay, you got to share that with a lot of the people there because they're going to tell you what's good, what's bad, and and how to fine-tune it. And you're an idiot if you don't pay attention to them. But when you're dealing with a, a role-playing game, you have you know tabletop role-playing game. You have a lot of other people that you have to pay attention to. You've got to. Uh, a campaign world things have to fit into ways of doing things that you have to match and then proceed even further to video games uh, you know the team that made oblivion was i think just under a hundred people that's not counting contract workers you know skyrim was probably closer to 200 and you know i don't even want to know what uh, starfield <laughs> is going to be but huge. there's huge teams and everything you do is compromise. Everything you do has to be uh, liked by multiple people. And that's good and that's bad. If you, you can't just say, well, this is what I want to do because it's my vision. You actually have to go and fix it and make it good. <laughs> you don't have an option. Uh, but on the bad side of it, it's gotta be something that appeals to everyone. It can't be more niche that way you have to uh you have to actually pay attention to the audience more and you're just one member of a uh, a team and your stuff has to fit hand in glove with everybody else's stuff well thank you bruce for taking the time it's been an awesome chat as i knew it would be <laughs> well, thank you i've enjoyed myself thoroughly it was great yeah, talking folks, to you go too. grab these the, the first book anyway I don't think we will be waiting too long for the second book. <laughs> no, no. If you do decide to buy the first book and uh, read it, you'll have to let me know what you think. I'm always uh, eager for feedback. Oh, sure. Yeah, I was kind of wondering, if, since you know so many famous novelists, have any of them, have you heard like from uh, Weiss? Or... <laughs> uh, I have not heard from, that, from Margaret Weiss. Uh, probably the two most prolific authors I know uh, that are still active are Margaret and uh, Troy Denning. I don't believe either of them have read my book. Uh, but Doug Niles, who probably comes in very close behind uh, Troy Denning for a number of books he's written, uh, he read it and he enjoyed it. So I don't know if he posted anything on uh, Kindle, but he's quoted in the uh, in the professional uh, reviews on the Amazon website. So you can see what he had to say. And I got some of the old TSR guys to uh, actually read it and comment on it uh you know janelle jayquays and harold johnson oh, and a couple sure. others she's great yeah. so if you look at the uh at the review tags uh not the uh purchasers reviews but the ones that the author posts uh you'll see those on uh, amazon what they thought of the book that's amazing all right well uh yeah thanks again <laughs> I kind of want to get back to the book. <laughs> <laughs> That's on chapter three, you know, for this uh, interview, but I feel like I need to find out what happened. So kind of left me with a squirrel and a question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, he's he's one of my favorite characters. I like oh, yeah, I could see. I'm really excited. Uh, 
Uh, see you soon. Okay. And well, that's all for this episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Man, you know, one of my favorite guests. Really was a fun getting to chat with Bruce. Learned a lot of stuff myself, of course. I always do. It's the reason I like to do these interviews. Uh, but anyway, this would not be possible. There would be no Matt Chat. Uh, what are we up to here? 485 without you. You make it possible. You do the uh, heavy lifting. You go to that little link in the show notes, the Patreon site. You take took a couple minutes to set up that little account and throw a little buck towards Matt. Or maybe it's a euro. I don't know. <laughs> uh, whatever kind of currency you use uh, but you supported the show and you made this possible and i thank you for that thank you thank you thank you you are good people so thank you very very much now if you are one of those thousands upon thousands of people who watch the show enjoy the show but don't contribute to the show <laughs> <laughs> Rectify that error. <laughs> Folks, a couple of, come on. You buddy mad here. Don't you want me to, you know, don't you want to help out? Just go to that link in the show notes. Patreon, couple minutes, boom, bada, boom, bada, bing. Uh, if you don't like that, go to matchat.us. You can use PayPal. Uh, let PayPal be your pal. <laughs> hey, PayPal could use your support too, man. I don't know if you've been, <sighs> different topic. Uh, hey. Go support the show. You'll like it better. You get access to the Discord channel. You get to chat with all kinds of uh, folks like the ones I'll be talking about here in a minute. Uh, so thank you very much for supporting the show. Oh, yeah. Okay. What about that news from the Matt Cave? Oh, do, 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 do. Yes, I'm a journalist. You know, don't turn on the real news. There ain't nothing but bummers. <laughs> Turn on Matt Chat News. <laughs> You're like, man, yeah, world's awesome. Hey, Elder Scrolls. Hello, just talking to Bruce about it. Guess what? Just because they knew somehow I was going to be interviewing Bruce, Steam or Bethesda, whoever, I don't know, Bethesda, <laughs> probably, has made Elder Scrolls 1 and 2 available for free on Steam. This is pretty awesome. Now, if you remember, Bethesda did this a long time ago. They had these, at least Arena, I'm not sure if they had Daggerfall for free, maybe kind of come and go, but they would you know, have it free for a while, and then they'd take it down for a while. I don't know what the hell was going on. Uh, but anyway, it's, I would just say grab it now. You know, don't wait. Who knows how long it'll be free. Uh, I just go to that Steam. If you're on Steam, go ahead and grab, a, grab these, stick them in your library. Hey, you never know. <laughs> uh, if you want to play... Uh, Daggerfall, go back and watch Matt Chat 118. You know, that's been a long time ago, hasn't it? 118, but man, it seemed like yesterday. Really fun. One of my favorite uh, games to review is a fun video, I think. You'll never forget that lady with the with the pipe organ. <laughs> Chilling all sexy by the pipe organ when there's a saber-toothed tiger running around upstairs. <laughs> oh, it's fabulous time. So anyway, go check out Matt Chat, but grab those games too. All right, yeah, speaking of that Discord channel with awesome people on it, Punny, 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 Punny is on there, and Punny is just posting all kinds of stuff. Just never sleeps. <laughs> you know, Punny, are, do you watch this show, or do you just stay on Discord? You know, some people post on Discord, and they support the show, but they don't watch these episodes. They don't realize I'm talking about them. You know, maybe their ears are burning. Like, hmm, why are my ears burning? I don't know. Somebody talking about me, but they don't watch the show, so they don't know. Funny, I'm going to call you up. <laughs> if I don't see some comment in the show about, oh, yes, I watch the show, I'm going to know. I'm going to know, Punny. <clears throat> anyway, <laughs> just joking. <laughs> I'm in a weird mood today. Maybe they're, there's some kind of construction going on outside. Maybe they're pumping some fumes in here. I, I don't know. Uh, anyway, Punny wrote in about some awesome stuff. Uh, first, uh, Pathfinder Wrath of the Righteous interview. Uh, they got Alcat Games on here. Two or three different folks from Alcat here to talk about these DLCs. They all sound great, but just the general topic I thought was interesting. Of, you know, what do you do? What can you do in a DLC? Is from like a designer, from a studio perspective. 
you know, it's kind of a, an interesting space to work in. You know, you're not doing the original campaign. You got a little more flexibility. You could be a little bit weirder, a little bit more innovative, maybe. Try out some different stuff. Uh, so these, are, you know, it really gives you good insights. This interview does, I think, on uh, that sort of process behind the scenes, thinking on DLCs. Uh, I just thought it was really fun. It's a good interview, I think. <clears throat> And then Maiko, another one of these uh, Discord folks. Now, Maiko, do you watch the show? Because I'm going to be looking for a comment from you, too. Uh, you, know, you better like the video. <laughs> uh, so, oh, man. Maiko has awesome stuff here. <clears throat> do I have to ask this question? Have you read the Dragonlance books? I'm talking about... Uh, the Dragons books, uh, what is the time of the, what's the name of the, there's a name for like the whole series, uh, Time of the Twins and Dragons, and <laughs> Dragons of Autumn, Dragons of Summer, uh, Blank Chronicles, there we go, uh, the Dragonlance Chronicles, uh, have you read those? Uh, if the answer to that is no, okay, I want you to drop what you're doing, it takes time off work, whatever you have to do, <laughs> get those Chronicles novels, there's three of them, Margaret Weiss and Tracy Hickman, read those things, because they are awesome. Uh, some of my favorite novels, you know, it's, you know, some people compare it to Tolkien and Lord of the Rings. You know, to me, I love Tolkien, too. Uh, to me, he's kind of more literary, more literature. You know, great stuff. I would, you know, hopefully you've read that. <laughs> uh, if not, maybe you want to read those, too. But, man, I just, those Dragonlance books are great. You know, definitely check those out. But anyway, I kind of lost the uh, the train here. Uh, so what the news is, is Dragonlance and also Spelljammer. <laughs> Spelljammer. <laughs> Adventures in space. Okay. Not my cup of tea. Uh, but anyway, if you like it, good news for you, because both of those things are coming to the fifth edition. Uh, so if you've got a little group, you're doing tabletop, playing fifth edition, you're kind of bored with the stuff that's out there. Or you got some uh, young whippersnappers, uh, little Padawans there in your group who've never played Dragonlance <laughs> or Spelljammer. Well, here's your chance. You can bring them in. Uh, let's see. It's called Unearthed Arcana, Heroes of Kryn. So you get all kinds of fun stuff you can work into this 5th edition rule set. Uh, it's free. The Heroes of Kryn is free. Uh, the Spelljammer one, I think, is in some kind of pre-order stage. Uh, but anyway, I'll put the links there for you. You're going to have Kinder, not <laughs> to be confused with Hobbits. I mean, you know, let me just, uh, can I have a, a minute here to talk about this? All right, Hobbits and Halflings. Now, my understanding is that the Hobbit is, well, like Tolkien trademark that somehow, or, like, you know, it's like you can't use Hobbit in uh, D&D &D or uh, in your own games or whatever because it's some kind of infringement. So you have to use Halfling instead. But I've been reading Lord of the Rings, and he goes back and forth. You know, he calls them, basically my understanding from a Tolkien's perspective is that the hobbits themselves, they call themselves hobbits. And that's sort of their name for themselves. Uh, but other people call them halflings. You know, the word halflings, and there's a couple other variations on that, you know, Tolkien. <laughs> so he kind of goes, you know, halfling, hobbit. Uh, you know, I don't quite get what all the fuss is about. <clears throat> Uh, but apparently, <laughs> you know, you can throw Kinder, K-E-N-D-E-R, I believe, in, into that mix as well. All these different names uh, for these little people. <laughs> Some of my favorite characters to play, by the way. I love uh, <clears throat> It's just kind of fun to me, playing hobbits. But, you know, for the longest time, I was going with this halfling thing. But now I just say, you know, just, just call them hobbits. You know, they call themselves hobbits. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, then Punny uh, wrote in again. This is why I'm talking so much about Punny, because Punny wrote about, uh, told me about this series, Age of Fear, apparently already up to game number five. Wow. Where is this? <laughs> well, I've, I've never heard of this before. Uh, but anyway, the fifth one is called The Day of the Ratch. Oh. <laughs> All right, I'm already excited about this. Day of the Rat. Yes, please. Uh, this is Les La Sleeko, Sleek Slilko, <laughs> developer. And it looks maybe like a Polish or Russian or Czech, I don't know. One of those, uh, develop, one of those countries probably. This is coming out in 2022, and it's about 
Well, it's about rats, folks. Uh, <laughs> the description doesn't mention rats. It's like, Undead King, Sir Edward's Blade, End of Blackheart, Mercenaries, something, uh, well, Young Witch, Lexa, A Dashing Black Knight, Indolf, Knights of Knee, uh, Allies in Short Supply, blah, blah, blah. But look, it's got rats. <laughs> and this Age of Fear series sounds kind of interesting to me. You know, I thought this, it looked a little bit like Knights of the Chalice. You know, I kind of got that game on the brain since I've been playing uh, playing it so much. But, you know, this looks a little bit similar. But I don't know if there's a connection there, if they if he's even aware of this other series or how that works. Maybe I should get this uh, developer on, uh, Mr. Leslaw, on to talk about it. Uh, Sleeko, Sluko, Sluoko, that's <laughs> probably wrong. <laughs> you know, you can never pronounce a person's name. Just, just forget about it. Uh, anyway, Age of Fear, a long-running series of fantasy turn-based strategy games loved by fans for its tabletop war game battle system and in-depth RPG customization. If you're hungry for a no-nonsense, old-school turn-based strategy game, you've met your match in the Age of Fear series. Enter the fantasy world Age of Fear today! <laughs> oh, yes, I am hungry for that. Oh, oh I'm hungry for that! Yes, I'm going to be entering that fantasy world of Age of Fear today <laughs> i don't know about today folks i got it's the last week of classes actually that's over now it's like finals week now so guess who's got the big ton of grading to do yay i want to go to the age of fear i don't want to grade papers i want to go to the age of fear and kill rats <laughs> thank you less law uh, anyway let's wrap this up with a quote before i completely lose it i think i'm down to my last ounce of sanity all right, I was looking for quotes by uh, Tracy Hickman. Again, one of my favorite authors. I won't go into that again. Uh, got a lot of great quotes, but I thought this one, I don't know when he said this, but man, <laughs> this is like so astute. <laughs> now it goes something like this. We are all free to make our own decisions, but if the information on which we base those decisions is carefully selected and presented to us in the pre-thought-for-you form of a story, then how much of an informed decision can we make? Hmm. You see what I mean, huh? <laughs> Very astute, if you ask me. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed that, and I'll see you again next time. Feed.